On October 14, 1947, the Bell X-1 became the first crewed plane to ever break the sound barrier. This video covers its aerodynamics during that flight. At 43,000 feet, the Bell X-1 reached Mach 1.06, and we simulated it at these conditions as well as at Mach 0.5 to see how the aerodynamics over the plane changed when breaking the sound barrier. To see if the simulations were accurate, we found two articles, including one by John D. Anderson and Theodore von Kármán, detailing some of the shocks over the aircraft so we can compare our results too. Also, the model we used is a scan of the actual plane which now sits in the Boeing aviation hangar. One unexpected detail of the model is that it wasn't smooth. Looking at this scan and the pictures of the Bell X-1 that first broke the sound barrier, its surface was kind of rough and there were various bumps from the connections between pieces of the plane. At Mach 1.06, the simulation featured these little ripples that were also present, but to a lesser extent at Mach 0.5, so they don't seem to be an instability in the simulation due to sonic flow, but rather a result of the surface and these ripples then became amplified by the sonic flow. To see if these little ripples altered the accuracy of the simulation, Let's compare what we do know about the shocks forming over the Bell X-1 at Mach 1.06 and then what we see here in this simulation. The following cut planes show the velocity where different colors correspond to different velocities. Right now, these exact velocities aren't that important. The more important points are where the colors change rapidly. For example, here you can see how it goes from red to green in a very short distance. That means that the airspeed has dropped dramatically and that corresponds to a shock wave. We also have corresponding pressure plots for those interested. And we'll be using these various color changes to help us understand what's going on in the video and how they correspond to the aerodynamics we know occurred on the plane during its first supersonic flight. So in the publication, Research in Supersonic Flight and the Breaking of the Sound Barrier, John D. Anderson noted that at Mach 1.06, a shockwave formed ahead of the needle-like nose. We do get a shockwave here ahead of the needle nose, which you can see here by this faint but distinct rapid change in velocity. So that's a good sign. As a side note, apparently the pilot, Chuck Yeager, flew this mission with two broken ribs, which is two broken ribs more than I enjoy having. But there are more details given about other shocks forming over the plane. For example, further in this same document, as the Bell X-1 approached Mach 1, a pocket of locally supersonic flow formed over the top of the wing. This supersonic pocket was terminated at the downstream end by a shockwave oriented almost perpendicular to the flow, called a normal shock. In this video, which is a cut plane through the left wing, showing the velocity, we see the same phenomenon where we get very supersonic flow over the wing and then at the back of it, there is another shockwave and it is fairly perpendicular to the flow. So the flow over the wing seems to be largely correct here. We'll go into more detail of what this region is and why it forms a little later. Now, the final shockwave location given in this document is that there was a shockwave forming a short distance in front of the nose. Now, I'm not sure if here they're referring to the same shockwave in front of the needle nose, which we covered earlier, or another shockwave forming in front of the regular nose of the plane. In this simulation, we do get both, so I don't know. But another very important aerodynamic feature of this plane as it hits Mach 1.06, but isn't found in this document, is that a shockwave formed over the horizontal stabilizer of the plane, so the flat plate at the back. This shock formed ahead of the control surface, and the reason why this shock is so well documented is that it rendered the elevator, so the flap at the back, ineffective at controlling the plane's pitch. During the flight, Jaeger reported this trouble, and due to quick thinking, they switched to rotating the entire horizontal stabilizer to control the plane's pitch. As we see here, this zone can rotate as one. Once Jaeger did that, he regained control of the plane. In this simulation, we do get this shock and it is ahead of the elevator, so that's another detail the simulation gets right. Apart from these key details, I couldn't find any other details about the flow over the plane when breaking the sound barrier, but the fact that we have at least three features and possibly four confirmed is good news for the simulation. And for those wondering, uh, to get the simulation right, it took over a month. Initialization was the biggest difficulty with the simulation wanting to diverge at the start. These simulations were done with OpenFoam. If you want to learn OpenFoam, then check out our courses here. Let's now see how this plane performed at Mach 0.5 and at Mach 1.06 because the shocks forming over this plane are very different to how shocks form over supersonic planes today. 
In fact, back in the 1940s, the designers recognized that the field of ballistic aerodynamics was much more advanced in this respect, and even Isaac Newton noted that artillery rounds were dancing with supersonic speeds 300 years ago. So the designers borrowed the Bell X-1's general shape from a 50 caliber bullet. You can see how the fuselage is shaped very much like a high-speed bullet heel, and even with a pretty blunt end. Then some wings and tail were strapped to it, and needles too. And these needles were put in place hopefully to pierce the shock waves, and allow the rest of the plane to travel through them. One important point to note here is that the Whitcomb area rule isn't followed here. That's because at this time the transonic rule was just being discovered and it took several more years to enter into aerodynamic design theory. If you don't know what the Whitcomb area rule is, we made a video explaining it in detail here. Looking at this video, we have just regions of very high pressure shown, in other words, where the shocks are. Overall, there are a few major ones, one faint one well ahead of the needle nose, then one a little ahead of the main nose of the plane. That's the biggest one here. We then get ones over the leading edges of the wing, and that's to be expected here for a couple reasons. The first is that the flow is already supersonic, so anything you put into the flow is going to create a shock wave. The second reason why we get shocks at the very leading edge of the wings is that the wings aren't swept back very much at all, just a few degrees, and the trailing edge is even swept forwards a little. That's an important difference between how supersonic planes are designed today compared to this very first one. Today, supersonic planes are designed with a lot of sweep backwards. 30 degrees and steeper is very common. They're swept back because that, first of all, means that the leading edges are pulled back from any shocks forming. They're enclosed in the shock wave instead of hitting it. Also, sweep helps delay shock waves, but that isn't really relevant here when going supersonic anyway. So the unswept wing creates a huge shock wave. We then get another shock wave when we reach the tail. You can see this little extension. This pokes into the flow and helps create a shock wave. The reason for this extension is usually to increase the plane stability in the yaw direction. Finally, as we hit both the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer, we get another shock. It might be just two shocks that coalesce together, but it's hard to tell because they form so close to each other. Comparing this to a typical modern plane that is designed to go as fast as possible and hence reduce the number of shocks, there is still a shock at the nose, then the wings are designed to fall behind the shock upstream. And then the tail generally doesn't have the horizontal stabilizers, which further reduces the shocks formed. Now I should mention that this is for a typical modern plane designed for speed, but there is also a new school of thought, somewhat still new, that suggests that it's better to create many smaller shocks along the plane because these smaller shocks don't coalesce into larger shocks, and hence the bad effects like loud sonic booms are mitigated, but that's a different supersonic topic. Here in the early days, the main technology employed to break the sound barrier were needles. It should also be noted that the Bell X-1 also features various instruments around the plane to give information about the flight conditions, for example on the right wing tip. We even get shocks forming on these instruments too. In this orbit, we see regions of flow over 350 meters per second, which is about Mach 1.2 at this altitude. And you can see just how fast the flow gets just past the cockpit and over the wings and horizontal stabilizer. Speeds up to almost 400 meters per second occur, which is Mach 1.35. And this shows us one reason why it was so hard to break the sound barrier to begin with. The flow accelerates so much that already by the time you're at like Mach 0.8, you've already got supersonic flow and the associated increased drag. So to even get to Mach 1, you have to go through a very long period of high drag. In addition to this drag, strangely, maintaining control was also a limiting factor and had to be overcome in order to break the sound barrier. And I say that it's strange because maintaining control was also the challenge that was stopping the Wright brothers flying too. So it's weird how effectively the same problem was stopping two major aeronautical breakthroughs. In addition to these orbits, we have videos of the velocity and pressures in the center planes. This one is of the velocity and the blue corresponds to 100 meters per second, which is about Mach 0.33. The red corresponds to 400 meters per second, which is about Mach 1.35. We've already seen these shocks forming over the plane, but one interesting point is all of this blue unsteady flow here. This is actually a shock induced boundary layer separation phenomenon. What that means is that the flow close to the surface is hit by the shock and that causes it to separate from the surface and effectively become awake. 
that's not good for two reasons. The first is that this typically increases the drag. And the second is that this flow is now slower, which means that it has less kinetic energy and it is hitting the tail. That makes the tail less effective and less efficient. We get the same shock induced boundary layer separation phenomenon on the underside of the plane, but fortunately there is no tail downstream of it, so its negative effects aren't as great. In this cut plane, which is now one meter to the left of the center line and cuts through the wing and horizontal stabilizer, we also get shock induced separation over the wing, and that means that the wing is now producing more drag and less lift. But fortunately, the rear shock over the horizontal stabilizer actually forms well behind it, so it's not in any danger of the same bad shock induced separation effect. Comparing these velocity plots to when the X1 is at max 0.5, we can kind of understand why we get some shocks where we do, because at already max 0.5, you can see how much of the flow speeds up just behind the cockpit. Look how red it is, which corresponds to much faster flow than the green coloring upstream. So it makes sense that this is one of the locations where supersonic flow will first appear. I mean, here we're getting flow speeds 20% and even 30% faster than the free stream flow already. And likewise, in this plane that cuts through the left wing and the horizontal stabilizer, we can see just how much the flow accelerates over the surfaces. And one thing to note is that the underside of the stabilizer has much faster flow than on the top surface. That's because in this configuration, it's actually an inverted wing, so it is actually producing downforce. It's doing that to balance the plane. And because it's doing that, the flow accelerates more on the underside than over the top surface, and that comes with lower pressure underneath too. Now back to when the plane is at Mach 1.06, we also have a video showing the temperature in a cut plane down the middle of the plane. The values range from 160 Kelvin to 320 Kelvin. And it's pretty amazing just how quickly the temperature changes along the plane, which is because of the shocks hitting certain regions. And in the separated boundary layer, the flow is much hotter. Comparing these temperatures to when the plane is at Mach 0.5, you can see how the temperature changes is pretty much nothing over the entire plane. So that shows that to get even a little bit of heating or cooling, you need to be pretty close to the speed of sound, otherwise you don't get any heating really. The technical description of this is that as you reach the sound barrier, the shock waves produce anisotropic changes that manifest as temperature changes. On the other hand, when you're traveling much slower than the speed of sound, so that no shocks form, the flow is more or less isentropic and hence very little energy is lost to heat. Just the general viscosity is producing heat, but that's relatively negligible here. That is the aerodynamics of this first ever crude plane to break the sound barrier. Peace out amigos.